talking social engineering in the other room. Want to get started? I'll get started. We didn't get another mic, so we're going to do awkward standing in front of the slides mic. Oh, we're good? Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's seven and we have a gazillion slides, so. That's me. That's me. I'm awesome. I thought you knew. <laughs> That's why they're here, obviously. Yeah. So uh, last time we had about 20 minutes of philosoph philosophical things. We're skipping it. Uh, everything applies from last year. Agenda. So uh, we like who uses LinkedIn for OSINT? Only like four people. All right. So the rest of you can learn something. Um, so anyone know what a LinkedIn open networker is? Like two. The guy that saw my slide, my slides, I know the hackers. <laughs> so uh, what you can do is you can use the LinkedIn API to start enumerating information. But all that information is based out on who you are on LinkedIn. Uh, so the idea is make a fake account, start connecting with recruiters because they recruit and connect with everybody, and then connect with all the open networkers. The API gives you the ability to, to do queries on people, groups, companies, everything else. Um, and you get only get names from your first and second order connections, which comes to be important later. So for the past couple months, uh, Rob and I have been busy with uh, John making a big ass LinkedIn network. Um, John's awesome. Now he has 171 connections which connect him to 14 million people. So why? Well, you get cool shit like second level connection to Obama's if you do that. Um, problems with the LinkedIn API, like I said, it's limited to your connections. Uh, it gives you no information about your third order people, where if you go to the web page, you'll actually see some information about the third order people. And the total number of results you can get even via the API is going to be limited to uh, your user account level. So if you don't pay, you get 100. If you pay, you get a lot more. So some examples. There's me. I've been on LinkedIn four or five years. So against Palantir, I have 12 second degrees, and John has 124 and three first degrees. Those are all recruiters. Is that useful if you were to do a pen test against Palantir? Cool, got a couple nods. Pfizer, uh, 31 second degrees, 553 uh, second degrees for John. John's existed for like three months. <laughs> yeah, John's active. Bank of America. So it's kind of important to highlight here, I actually have a friend that works at Bank of America. They're blocked out. but. John has a thousand second degrees and I only have 258 and I actually have a first order connection. So from a grabbing emails and doing neat stuff from that perspective, um, you much, anybody think that's useful? Cool. Whee! So a little more of that. I want to turn all those email addresses I get from doing OSINT into validated LinkedIn contacts and emails. Um, the easiest way to do that is to import them because it has a function of like, let's connect everything you have, every social media account you have in the world to LinkedIn and LinkedIn with everybody. So step one, get emails, import them. So the problem is they don't, you can't just import a e email address. You have to make a contact for that person. So essentially, it's working. It's really low. So essentially he's basically making a new Gmail account and importing the email addresses he finds into that Gmail account. So I just wrote a little bit of Ruby to do that. It basically just puts it in the correct CSV output to import in. So that piece of Ruby gives you something that looks like that, which you can now import into Gmail and now import into LinkedIn. And now you can take an email address and turn that into a person on LinkedIn. Right. So L. Gordon is now Lisa at Palantir Technologies. Now you can call her up and say, hey, Lisa, remember that one time? Or Richard Bennett, who is in the UK. So if you're going to send him an email, guess what time you need to send it? Not on your time frame. So who, who, yeah. Yeah. Who in here does IR? Nobody. Cool. You guys <laughs> ruin my day a lot of times. So thanks to like SANS and all these other courses that give you these standardized processes for doing stuff. You get a piece of malware, or you get a phishing site gets uh, reported to you guys, you shove the link into a bunch of URLs and sandboxes, do the lookup, is it known bad, is it you know Zeus, is it whatever, and then you feel safe. But it kind of sucks for me when I do that and I got 
super unlucky and I got the one person that gets hit every single fishing attack and she reports it to uh, IT. True story happened last month. <laughs> so what you could do is you could build a fish that I want everyone to know is a fish. Let that work its IR process. So who do they, who do they come from? Are they, using a co are they using a cable, like a Comcast cable pop to do their analysis, or are they coming from the corporate land? Uh, you know, which sandboxes start running and connecting to stuff? You know, you'll see blue coat hits, you'll see some guys in Russia, you'll see the guys from UC Santa Barbara hit you. Are there humans in the mix? Did someone actually go to the site and look at it and browse around, or did they just let the automated tool do its thing and make a yes or no decision after that? And so really the level of sophistication of the IR group. So once I know who's coming to do analysis, I can now send them to one thing you could do is now send them to alternate sites and keep the users going to the fish site. So I'm going to do that with Apache mod rewrite. So basically with this, you can say, hey, based on any of these conditions, I want you to go somewhere else. So anytime you're hitting me with curl or um, wget, I want you to go to totallysafesite.com. If, if they're hitting me from the outside IR address, you go to the totally safe site. Everything else goes to the fish site. Useful? Hilarious? Yeah, you can do some other cool tricks with Mod Proxy where it's actually their website, except for a, uh, a directory, and then they really, hilarity really ensues because it really is their site. <sighs> Still, you. Still me. All right, cool. Uh, anybody see the Apache or the uh, Adobe news about the code sign insert that came out just the other day? Who has found or used code sign inserts on tests? Hand, handy, right? So why? Have you, who's tried to buy one? It's a pain in the ass. I see why people just steal them because it's <laughs> it's way easier to steal one than actually go through the process of getting one. So why I'd want to do that is I can now sign my backdoors or my malware with the company's code signing cert. I could now be more trusted because it's just signed and now you get a blue pop-up instead of an orange pop-up and someone tries to run something. What does AV usually do when it sees a signed executable? Ignores it. It says, okay, it's good. Right. Anyone ever been able to get a hold of someone's SSL wildcard cert? <laughs> now you are their site for any other further attacks. That's kind of useful. So the problem with stealing certs is most of the time when I find one in someone's you know, directory, it's password protected. And while password one is a good password, um, it, it does happen that on occasion people have a better password than that. And the tools to actually crack those uh, certificates exist, but they're really slow. So however, if you can export it, then you can just set the password and then problem solved. So there's uh, two easy tools to use, uh, Mozilla CertUtil and then Mimikatz also does it. So Mozilla has CertUtil, you can download it on their page. Um, you have to compile it yourself, but people have made pre-compiled bins available if you choose to use that stuff. So it kind of looks like this. You want to use the cert util utility to list uh, all the certificates, and then any of them that are authenticating or code signing will, be ha will have that UUU uh, indicator. So you can kind of go through, list all the certs in someone's store, and say, oh, okay, that's a code signing cert. I want that one. That's only for Firefox. Right. There's Windows tools that do the same thing. Yep. Uh, now to extract, you can use PK12 util, basically just tell it which cert you want to extract, uh, give it the output file and give it the password that you want, because my password one is better than password one. Also do it with Mimikatz, it has the crypto library, anybody use that yet? It's pretty pimp. Now that it works in memory, you can do all kinds of neat stuff. So you have crypto list certificates will list certificates in various stores and this is how you can do all the Microsoft and Windows side of things. You can basically tell it what cert store you want to uh, in show all the certificates for and it will list them and once you have one that you're interested in you can do the crypto export certificates command and actually save that thing out it will output it through the local directory and you're good to go. So the cert store on Windows is where Chrome and IE store stuff so the whole gamut is here. So between the two, you can now pretty much cover anything. Uh, to kind of a, a takeaway and a to-do is to do this a little more automated, because right now it's kind of manual. You have to go through and be like, oh, that's important. But at least there's a way to do it. Yay. All right. So I put the other one down because it's not working. Well, it is, but not very well. 
So Mimikatz is awesome, and I want to execute it on bins, blah, blah, blah. Mimikatz good, click, check, woohoo! Y'all suck. <laughs> so does WCE. Woohoo! Yeah, okay. So, but everybody submitted it to AV, which. You, I had to be sure. <laughs> I had to be sure it doesn't get caught by AV. All right, so WC gets detected, SecURL gets detected, Mimikatz gets detected. WC is in memory, kind of. Is Hernan here? Damn. All right. Since uh, September 6th uh, this year, you can now fully support Mimikatz in memory, does not write to disk. WCE does actually write a DLL that gets caught by uh, AV. So just so you know, even if you use the Metasploit in memory stuff, still caught by AV. And sec uh, Mimikatz is no longer. So you just run that stuff. You're going to remember all that, right? On that stuff, and you can do it all in memory. There we go. So we're, this is kind of the end of hashes, right? We don't really need hashes anymore. Pass the hash sucks, right? We got clear text passwords. All right, so moving on, that's cool. We do it in memory, 6 September, get new versions. It's also uh, open source. So WC, not open source. It runs binary. You don't know exactly what it does. Maybe Cats is now fully open source. You can download it for um, Google Code. Uh, incognito. Anyone ever run incognito? Raise your hands. Anyone ever run fine token? Raise your hands. It's pretty cool. It's more than I expected. Yeah, it's more than I expected. Fine token does some really cool stuff. It says, where's the logged on users? It does this via a API call. Now, I've been using Railgun for a really long time, like since Matt Patrick or whoever actually did it, uh, submitted it to Metasploit, and I now am a Windows coder. So I am releasing today, or we're releasing today, NetView. Now, any, what, who knows what NetView does? Someone shout it out. Wow, no one knows what NetView does. Shares? Really? Wrong. Failed. List of computers in the domain. Yay. Yay. OK. So NetView does a lot more than that. So. Um, you can run it with a domain, a file, a list of files, so you can do that. Um, and it outputs to a file so that if it runs for an hour, you don't have to watch it. Also takes host names, so a lot of times you have to do IP, like a Metasploit, you've got to convert it to an IP to do any of that kind of stuff. Yep. This uses a host name, which is how So out. this output, very greppable. Um, what it does is it says, hey, I found three hosts. Uh, the comment for DC1 is nothing. It's, it runs OS 6.1. It's a domain controller. It has I, this IPv4 address. It will actually get a bunch of IP uh, addresses. So if it has seven IP addresses, it's a multi-home system, it will show you all of them. Then it shows um, shares, admin dollar, C dollar. So if this thing has a G dollar because it has a, a big-ass hard drive that's connected to it and automatically has that uh, admin share, it'll show it, net log on, all that kind of stuff. Sessions, if someone is logged in via a share to it, they get the, um, a login session and where they're coming from. You want to make a comment here? Yeah, so this is handy because usually we get a, first thing we do is do the uh, net group uh, domain admins, WAP domain, so we know who all the domain admins are. Uh, generally, you're not going to see these guys connecting out even with this. What which, which you are going to need to find is map domain admin to user account, right? And then we want to get on their workstations and then Mimikatz them because they're probably going to have RDP'd or done something from there. So with the enumerating session info piece, you can actually see, you know, domain admins, regular user account connecting to the domain controller, connecting to the other thing. Once you know that, you can grep for that. You know their workstation and then you can kind of go Mimikatz from there. I don't know about everybody else, it can be difficult to find the domain admin's workstation in a couple thousand node domain. Or the CFO or whatever or you're whoever going you're looking for. Right, so this, instead of getting 500 shells, you only need to do one or two. So logged on users just like fine token. So I incorporated fine token and NetView and all this crazy stuff into a single binary. Um, and it's already on GitHub. Woohoo! Anyone find that useful? Like, it, it shows you a bunch of stuff. 
So it takes your enumeration of your domain from a week down to about five minutes. I ran it across a large domain, and it took about an hour to finish. So that's, that's like 300,000 hosts. And it, anyways. That's awesome. I've been, we've been using it for uh, about a month. It's great. So dropping binaries is a necessity sometimes, but unless you want, you name your uh, bin SVC host or SVS host, um, you don't want it to look like this, right? <laughs> Meet Ditto. Ditto does one thing very well. It takes a source and copies all of the resources of a, of a file into another binary. So you say, hey, uh, C colon program with Fireshark.exe, evil binary, and Ditto says, okay, I copy here and put there. And now you have a cool little icon on it. Now, Resource Hacker can do that really easy, but you can't do that on, you know, Target or whatever. But Resource Hacker doesn't do this. Ooh. So that's what Ditto does, and he's also already on GitHub. All right, so that's, those are the two code releases that we're doing. Um, we're going to talk about PSExec. Everybody knows about Metasploit's PSExec, right? <laughs> there are more than 10 ways to do PSExec, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. SysInternals has a tool called PSExec. Can everybody know what? <laughs> it actually predates Metasploit's. You can use it. It does cool stuff. Disadvantages. Needs a password leaves PSExec service running. If you, like, I'm a big, I harp big on uh, indicators of compromise. If you don't know what your binary does or your module does or whatever does, and on the GUI side of things, don't run it. So it's really easy to see PSExec service running on a, on a system. Um, so, but it's never going to get caught by AV, uh, executes the binary as user instead of system. This is an important deviation or, or point that you'll understand later. PSExec uses hashes. Some of these catch um, the service binary. Run DLL32 is running. What? It's now a unicorn when it doesn't. <laughs> True. Uh, so anyone know about the PSExec MOF option? It's kind of hidden in the advanced features uh, or advanced options for PSExec and Metasploit. So what it does on XP and below is takes a MOF for file, it's just a MOF file, puts it on Windows, and guess what Windows automatically does with it if it's in a specific directory? Runs it. You throw a file on a disk and it runs. Awesome. So um, it requires you to have access to the admin dollar, and it, right now it's XP only because Metasploit doesn't have the ability to compile MOFs yet. Egypt, I don't know. Um, met, uh, so Egypt also wrote uh, PSExec as user, which is really useful. Um, uh, someone asked me uh, on Twitter a couple months ago, why would, that, why would you even need that? One of the biggest things is UAC bypass, and we'll talk about that again later. Negatives being the same as normal PSExec and Metasploit. WMI needs a password, never going to be on AV, executes as user instead of system. PowerShell, same thing. Remcom. Who's heard of that? Nobody. <laughs> awesome. Well, you got something today. You got you something know. new today. All right, cool. It's an open source PSD deck. You can add past, past the hash. We'll, you'll see someone who already did that a little bit later. Runs as system, so that's a negative. We'll talk about that later. Um, and it's a binary. So you either have to throw it onto the target, which is not always great. Um, whoa. Oh. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Talk over. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, he went to sleep. Oh, fail. Woohoo! <laughs> hey, is there, can, is there a power outlet that's over here? Because this isn't supposed to be. Uh, the pipe against the wall. Fail. Yeah, over there. <laughs> All right. Um, while he's doing that, anyone? Uh, so. The NetView also does uh, SQL servers. So if anybody's ever run OSSQL, yes, no, old school tool. All right, so you run it, and it 
it essentially does the same thing as NetView now. So all of those tools you used to use are all in NetView now, and it does it at all at once. Cool? Uh, and Ditto's really simple. It, all it does is copy resources. Working on it. Wake up, wake up, oh, wake up, oh, wake up. It's a first one. Yay, big time fail. White. Right here. Should have brought the Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe asked out here. And from now on, we're going to draw slides. Can you? Shadow puppets? Can you just push power up? No, hold power. All right, does anyone else know any PS exec that, um, that we haven't talked about yet? It's fucking embarrassing. And math PS exec. <laughs> <laughs> because he's the guy that wrote it. It's starting. Call WMI. Uh, Call WMI and? Oh, oh, oh. I actually got to him. <laughs> Via PowerShell or vice versa, and you can actually compile something and run as inject, like using a, a power syringe into a user process when that process executes. So the thing executes before, injects that, and you can use the user process. Everybody hear that? No. <laughs> Please repeat it. No. Does it actually command shell count? No. Here's Chris's password. <laughs> Sorry. What are mod files? Mo what are mod files? Why does that work? Uh, so they're um, com sort of well on Windows. They're, on Windows XP, they're not compiled, but and or they're sometimes. But um, Windows Seven, they're compiled like WMI scripts, basically. That's all there. I love Microsoft because it keeps on adding awesome ways for us to do things without having extra tools. Every, uh, everyone likes PowerShell. It's an awesome tool, right? Almost there. Almost there. At. Old school. Actually, we'll be going over that in a few seconds. Will it work? Does it blend? Oh, yay, boo, yay. Source detected. Yay, OK. No, really, I do computer shit for a living. <laughs> Ramcom, WinAXE, all right, continuing on. WinAXE, everybody heard of WinAXE? It's on his blog. You can find it out there. Um, same, same problems, same negatives, positives. <coughs> SMB exec, the guys who wrote SMB exec in there? No? Okay, they wrote some awesome stuff. Um, uh, pure hate did it as well. So, same issues, same problems, same positives. Pass the hash for 15 years? Some of those guys might be in here. You guys here? Boo. Well, thanks. Anyway. All right, so while this isn't PS exec, it's definitely something you need to know about. It's actually a, 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 a package inside of Backtrack, so all of you guys who use Backtrack can easily install this stuff. Uh, SMB mount, SMB client, Firefox, you can pass the hash with Firefox. Cool? Awesome. RPC client, anyone know what RPC client is? Use it constantly? Yeah, you should check it out. Uh, again, blog post over here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. Are you in here? Ah, uh, boo. So Zach Faisal stuff, it's a web app that does uh, uh, persistent uh, SMB relaying. So it'll take one connection in, and then you can issue it multiple times to different hosts, which hasn't been done before, at least not publicly. So the uh, Core Impact guys, 
A long, a long time ago, they released Impacket. Anybody remember that? It was like five years ago. Uh, it's old. it's set dead for a long time. They just started reworking on things, and uh, included is a RimCom script that accepts past the hash, and then a whole bunch of other things, uh, MSSQL libraries, uh, RPC dump, SAM dump, all kinds of cool libraries that support past the hash, um, and you can get it there. WinRM. Anyone know what WinRM is? I'll tell you a good story about this. Guys at my, where I work uh, came up to me and said, hey, could you check out this uh, new uh, Windows management tool that we want to use inside the uh, environment? And I said, sure, no problem. And I, I, I looked at it, and it was like, whoa. <laughs> Can I use that? And, there, and then I went back to them and said, no, you cannot use it in our environment. For one interesting reason. <laughs> it is straight up HTTP that does NTLM and runs a command. So clear text, NTLM, and directly runs commands without services. Woo -hoo! That's freaking awesome, man. Do you scan for 5985 anymore? No, and that doesn't. Not by default. It should be in your defaults. So the interesting thing about WinRM is the attacker, or the person connecting to it, sets all their configs to what they trust. <laughs> what? I will trust this remote host that I'm going to execute code on. I will, I will do it over an unencrypted channel. OK. So, so much fun to be had. Awesome. Still requires a password, sort of. It does HTTP and NTLM authentication. What framework does that? Metasploit, PSExec, WinRM. <laughs> It's currently vaporware. We're still working on the stupid SOAP requests that need to be happening, but in the works, going to happen, going to be awesome. Not on GitHub yet. <laughs> or if you can't, if you're in a restricted environment, you can't get Metasploit or any of these other tools, you can't copy stuff in, um, or, well, you can write your own. So build your own PyBear. I tried with PySMB, but all the libraries are too complex for me, the, the Python suckiness of tabs. Um, so you can try it, or you can use and pack it. Uh, if HD's in here. Um, so one late night, I was talking to HD about stuff. And as my problem was, I was, in an, I was doing a pen test for an enclosed environment. And I couldn't get anything into the environment, so I had to write it out myself. So I'm like, hey, do you know how to PS exec like with PowerShell or something like that? And he's like, well, you can lib use LibRex. And I'm like, ooh, I can. So um, he just wrote it, <laughs> as he does. It's annoying. In like 15 minutes. That's happened more than once. <laughs> and he committed to the Metasploit tree, so everybody can use it. So it's in slash tools, and you can use a standalone Ruby PS exec which you can then compile into an executable and run wherever you want with the full power of Metasploit's LibRex, so hashes, all that kind of crazy jazz. All right, this is real quick, um, and then it's back to Chris. UAC sucks, right? Because it takes two things to bypass. Anyone know what those two things are? One, you need admin access. Okay, so you have to be an admin. It's, UAC is not stopping you from becoming an admin. It's stopping you from being a low privilege admin to a higher privilege admin, okay? So that's the first one. Everybody could generally get that, right? Second one is you need to find a network that has more than one host. Pretty easy to find. It's kind of defined in the whole network term. Look at that. So I do an at locally, can't do it. I am not an administrator, but I do an at on a host that I am an admin on. It allows it. What? UAC is not a security boundary, OK? That's so stupid that it works. That's it. Oh, I got one more. OK. Crap. <laughs> All right, so anyone migrate into a system process and go, fuck. From HTTP, HTTPS? Because they have proxy settings. 
everyone only gets to use reverse Nobody. TCP. Everybody uses reverse TCP over 4444 out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you're in a scenario where you have to use reverse HTTPS or HTTP because they have proxy settings and don't allow anything out, system is not something you want to migrate into because it doesn't have proxy settings. As we stated in the other ones, uh, those specific PS execs put you in system, which means you instantly no, have no shell. Has right? anyone tried to PS exec with Metasploit in a place that has an authenticating proxy? Did it work? No. no. It doesn't for that very reason. So you can do it this way. Uh, for OS versions Vista or below Vista, it has a bits admin version of 1.0 or 1.1 or whatever, which doesn't have these settings. So if you just SMB upload the correct bits admin or a newer version, 2.0 is fine, you get this awesome function slash util slash set IE proxy local system. And now system has a proxy setting. Yay. Please, 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 after you're done, set no proxy so that you don't have system having proxy settings all over someone's network and you make it easier for the real attackers. So we're trying to do good here, right? Yes. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> uh, so the MSF uh, PX is exact to your heart's content after it has a proxy setting. Uh, Metasploit does not use the win HTTP proxies, but if you write something that does, here's how to do it with those. Slides will be online later. Registry poking. The first way I thought about doing this was in the registry um, with the proxy setting of soxy, uh, proxy settings per user. Uh, if you set it to zero, guess what it does? Makes it system wide. So if you, it is system wide, that means the proxy settings work for system, network service, and everything. Breaks a lot of stuff, requires a reboot to actually initiate. <laughs> yep. And that's it for me for a while. Yay. All right. Yay. <laughs> Dude, I'm going to owe so bad after this. All right, so set up. Who doesn't love remote access trojans that come in Windows for you? Who's used bits? If you have Windows, you use bits. That's how it's downloading all your updates. So basically, it's a file transfer service motherfucker. <laughs> Go away. So there's basically three jobs. I'm, I'm leaving it. Deal with it. Yeah. I'm, fuck it. I'm dealing with it. So you can do download jobs, upload jobs, then upload. Ah, oh, went away. Reply jobs. Uh, we're mostly concerned with the first two. What? You wanted to come back? Just give it a minute. So basically, um, you have to set up a bits server. You can. I think you can do it with Apache, but I know you can do it with every flavor of IIS has a plugin to do that. You then use uh, PowerShell to do the actual uploading and downloading. So you import the bits library, bits transfer, and then you can download basically start bits transfer, uh, the, remote, uh, I, the remote address and file that I want to get, and then where I want to put it on the local host. Pretty easy. Anybody used to this yet to get stuff in? A couple? Uh, it automatically uses the proxy settings. So yeah, it's already set. Um, same thing for uploading. Um, start bits transfer, the source, the file locally that I want to upload, and the destination, where I want to do it, transfer type upload. Pretty handy. And then it does that. If you want to do a really big file, bits is really awesome. It will just break it into chunks and do it when the network's not too busy, and it does a lot of cool, smart things for you. So the network's, the user's connection won't like totally tank while you're doing it. Or go really high up. And it looks like this. It's basically a bunch of post requests for the upload. And I think it's get requests for the other one. PowerShell. Is Carlos here? Man, no one came to the top, no dude. One, no one. Fuck it. All right. So PowerShell's awesome. You can do stuff like this. And anything you can do stuff this like that. This is the most important function of PowerShell. That's awesome. That's all you need. So it does a lot. So everybody checked out uh, Matt Graber's Exploit Monday and PowerSploit. Has everybody seen that? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, Carlos has been doing a whole bunch of uh, blog posts on it. Um, and I really haven't found a feature in Meterpreter that you can't do with PowerShell if you're willing to code it. Awesome. Would anybody disagree with that? Cool, everyone agrees. I win. 
<laughs> so cool examples of stuff that people put out is uh, the PowerShell hash dump that's in set. Uh, Dave Kennedy talked about it a while back. You can do various uh, payloads in Metasploit now support using PowerShell to exec the payload. Uh, PowerSploit and Power, and, uh, yeah, PowerSploit. You can do DLL injection, shell code injection, and some other things a la uh, PowerShell. You can port scan with it. Everybody know you can port scan with it? Cool, a couple people. So this one will show you. I want to look for all a uh, uh, list of ports. You can port sweep with it. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, anybody run into the execution policy problem? Do you have a question or are you just, no, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, um, so Dave's way smart and figured out that maybe, I don't know, I think it was Dave. So you can basically <laughs> do that. You can run any script you want with that command and it will just run whatever PowerShell you want. Bypass was a good idea. So that, that does, <laughs> That does require PowerShell 2.0 2 and above, so if you have an XP box that's got it, it's probably got the wrong version, but Windows 7 and above, it, it's the right version by default. Um, you can use the encoded command, so create command stuff from set, and then uh, Carlos just dropped this PSH exec. Basically, you can take a PowerShell script, uh, it shoves it all on base64 encodes it, and then you can use that command to actually execute the base64 encoded blob, which is handy. Because uh, you kind of run into issues of getting Metasploit, if you got a Metasploit shell, to actually get that PowerShell thing to run because it's interactive. Anybody tried to drop to PowerShell from Interpreter? What happens? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, that's the awesome part. So if you didn't lose your shell, you can at least try again. So, um, and I got way off track there. Metasploit also drops uh, payloads via the, the version one of PowerSploit method. So you can, any payload you want, you can actually output to your PowerShell file. Um, I did a blog post on the problems with 64-bit systems. So if it's a 64-bit system, you actually need to do the 32-bit uh, PowerShell if you run 32-bit payloads, or else it will run it with 64 and it will crash and burn on you. The other way to run them, if you don't want to use uh, the Carlos's method, is just run it as a bat file. So within Meterpreter, you can just call a bat file and that will actually run just fine. So you know, our bat file has our bypass, it has our script, run it that way, and then you can get your, your, your shell. Useful? Cool. Yeah. Woohoo! Woo so, is a web dev server, would a web dev server be handy uh, to download things from? Yeah? So, I actually dropped this the same day that the LinkedIn thing came out, and I don't think anyone noticed because they were too busy worrying about all that. Uh, the idea was I wanted to be able to uh, well, actually, a friend asked me if, I, if you could do it, but you wanted to see if you could use WebDAV to actually grab a file. And I extended that to say, well, I want to have Metasploit generate me one, or I wanted to host my own local file and download it. <clears throat> so it looks like something like that. You set it up on the other end, you net use the uh, IP of the system, and then you copy IP documents to executable then where you want it. All right, did you want to say something about that? Or you're going to talk about yeah. it. Rob's going to go into detail what happens when you do that and why that works. Uh, and it kind of it kind of looks like that. So it will basically try SMB, it will fail, then it will go into doing the web dev method and eventually download either your local executable that you specified or a Met Metasploit generated binary. All right, who's run the NBNS spoofer on a local assessment? It's come on, that's the best module on the planet. All right, so essentially what it does is spoofs NetBIOS traffic, right? Uh, anyone use the WPAT attack? One or two? Wow, you guys suck at pen testing. <laughs> I really want to know what you're using, man. I'm evidently missing the boat. Yeah, I don't know, like, what, what cool stuff are you guys using? Pixie dust. Pixie dust. <laughs> awesome. So one of the, nice. I'm done. Password one. Right answer. So the problem with land-based attacks is that you can only do them on a land, right? Um, like NetBIOS spoofing and all that. There's no tools out there that can really do all the cool stuff that you can do when you have a physical box right there on the network um, with your attack tools with it, or are there? So while we're on the subject of web dev, I want to access share three. On and uh, on a system, I can say, hey, Windows box, I want to access share three. If that Windows box does not have share three, what happens? It says, go I don't have F off, three. right? 
Is that it? Is that what happens? Yes, Windows, we know, no, yes. Yes. Actually, what happens if the web client thing is installed, which is XP and blah, 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 disclaimer. Um, it says, I want to access share three. I don't have access, I don't have share three on SMB. Then your Windows box then goes and says, hey, Windows box, do you have it on web dev? <laughs> Automatically. So if you're following along at home, Windows um, is always, unless, uh, unless otherwise disabled, listening on 445. So you can't really bind on 445, right? So you can't say, hey, Windows box, don't listen on that. I'm going to listen on you know, that for you as an attacker for victim one from an external. So this is all external, right? But it's rarely listening on 80. So guess what I get to do? Say, hey, fake NetBIOS NS. Anyone ever heard of that one? I just uh, found it on the net and re-released it. Um, it's not mine, so if they decide to tell me to take it down, I will. But uh, it's a binary that does, uh, it's a Windows binary that does NetBIOS spoofing. So you throw it on a victim, which isn't going to be detected by AV because it's part of the Honeypot project. And you say, hey, spoof everything on this network and all of it will come at you. And if they're, if they're trying to access share 50 on, on the net share and it does net bio spoofing and goes back to victim one, he's going to say, I don't have share 50. And then it'll go try on, on web dev. Meet port proxy. So port proxy is a very easy way of listening on a victim without having to do anything special. And it's built into Windows. Thank you, Microsoft. It does port forwarding for IPv4 to IPv4, v6 to v4, v6 to v6, v4 to v6. So I can say, hey, listening on 80 on the IPv4 address and ship it out over IPv6 over Terado. So I am essentially bypassing every single protection you have over IPv6 because it's tunneling IPv6 out. And with your powers combined, I get shells and hashes externally. <laughs> Boo. So this is why. It says, hey, give me share three. It says, OK, you're on my intranet. I'm going to auth, right? Um, that port proxy happens. It auto auths, and the hacker has the hash. Normally, in a fun functioning environment, Windows will not automatically authenticate to an external host. It's a security feature, but it will to an intranet host. So all you have to do is make your, your victim one your patient zero, right? So you say, hey, I am listening on 80, shipping it out over IPv6, and guess what? You get all the hashes. <coughs> Yay. The other cool thing about SMB Relay is you, can go, you can't go to the same host if it's the same protocol. So they're going over, they've switched to web dev. That means you can go back over your interpreter session over SMB. So you can authenticate as the guy that just authenticated you to their own host and get a shell. Awesome. You guys suck. It's awesome. So respectfully, I refrain from any inside out Google images because I'm taking the external to, you know, internal to external. So I didn't put that on there. You're welcome. Hey, man, we made it through the slides. Can't we did make it through the slides. That's awesome. Anybody use DNS payloads on pen tests? <laughs> cool. So quickly, what's uh, publicly available? You've got the Canvas DNS module, uh, DNS cat from Skull Security. DNS cat, that's a Java library that I didn't get on there, and then the Metasploit DNS payloads. So <clears throat> Canvas uses DNS text records to do its thing. I, um, I'm a little, I haven't, it's been a while since my network plus, but it looked correctly formed when I did it, looked at it in Wireshark. Um, direct, the problem with it is it directly connects to the host on UDP 53. How many people let that out? How many people think that's normal? For a host in your network. The one IR guy, is that normal? 
Right. So that's not normal. Anytime that you would probably need to pull out the Kong Fu and do a DNS payload, they're not going to be allowing that kind of crap out. So anybody, I've, I've never pen tested anybody good where I've gotten to the point where shit, I need to try a DNS payload that it worked. And it looks like that. Uh, that doesn't work. That, it works in the lab. That's where everything <laughs> works. Maybe it works in that lab. Um, so Skull Security, Ron, thanks for coming. The one, one person showed up. Yeah, uh, uses DNS requests. Uh, I think it's correctly formed. Uh, he made a Metasploit payload that kind of needs to be updated, which would be <laughs> awesome if he did. It, it kind of works. Kind of works in the lab. Uh, so you can use the DNS cat server, uh, and Metasploit will handle things. It, it, it kind of works. Again, not to bash it, it just never worked for me in real life. I think because of the same reason, it's going out and just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. But it's awesome. It works great when you play with it. Uh, so it looks like that. DNS cat, anybody seen this? The Java version. The Java version. So it comes as Java libs. It's actually fairly straightforward to get working. The problem is all it does is echo. E echo. You have so you can chat between two hosts. You could chat to act to actually do something useful. You've got to write some code to either uh, call an exec method, or you know on the website it says you want to do a point-to-point uh, -point tunnel through there, uh, which basically makes it Unix only. Unix only. <laughs> so not so useful. Looks like that. Uh, so currently, there's no full DNS payloads in Metasploit, uh, aside from the DNS cat payload, which is not in trunk. Um, there are a couple payloads that will actually go over DNS and fetch you another payload. Um, they're listed there, um, which is handy from a like C2, like I want to be persistent, and then you know every now and then, if you can figure out a way to make it at startup pull that in for you or whatever, that's useful. Uh, did I have another slide? No. So those two work pretty good from grabbing a payload. Uh, a guy on the internet put out a payload. Rob and I messed with it for a while. It's not working yet. Maybe it will soon. Works in the lab. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so bottom line, I have nothing public that's usable at the moment. Peace. I think I think we have like two minutes. Is there a question? That one. That one. This one. The Metasploit payload. The job version. Everyone's leaving. I'll talk to you about it after. <laughs>